Morning everyone, Merry Brexmas. Um, I've set up a guy over there who's going to say hello to Tom. He's going to wave if the pound tank's too far and then we can all evacuate. Um, hopefully that helps everyone uh, stay focused. Um, I was asked to come down here and talk a little bit about uh, our business um, uh, briefly and then give as many specific examples of this type of technology in use um, in the time allowed, which I've just been told is half, so I'm going to speak really fast. Um, uh, first, I'll just briefly talk about the why. Um, I try and, if anyone knows who our company is, I'll try and only tell you stuff that, uh, that, that you don't know. Um, this is a letter that I wrote when I was five. Uh, me and my mum were walking down uh, past Shanklin train station and um, opposite the barbers and there was a bin and I remember it pretty well because I was stressed and I saw the bin was overflowing and I thought to myself, what happens with that after it's full? Where does it go? And because I was five, I could not compute and so I just burst out crying. And my mum was like, what's the matter? And so we basically just binned off school for the day. Um, there were no fines then. And um, uh, we went home and we talked about it. And so like, let's, 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 uh, let's do something. Let's talk about this with the bin man. So I wrote a letter to the bin man. I said, I'm five, I'm worried about this issue. Will there be room left enough for me in the world when I'm a granddad? Where does the rubbish go? Um, anyway, the bin man wrote back. The guy who ran Biffer at the time was a ledge and he said, Yo, there's this thing called recycling, don't worry about it. So I didn't worry about it. And then, uh, then when I was a bit older, um, I, I got the chance to go to a, it was a studying as an engineer, I got a chance to go to a landfill site and see the stuff that you do not see um, uh, as a member of the public. And it, 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 it's hard to explain how it made me feel, but um, I knew at that point, whatever I did with my life, I did not want to be a part of that. So I talked to my brother about it, and he's really good at like business money and stuff. And he was like, let's start a business. And uh, so also, um, we couldn't find jobs, so like, we sort of had to do something. So we decided we we're going to start a business, and we started it in our mum's shed. And that's our shed. Um, anyway, um, so we started looking at like, we were kind of into like surfing and brands, and t-shirts are cool, so we like start a brand. Um, and we're looking at how we could make those products better but there's a kind of issue which is like, even if you change all of the materials and make it like 50% less impact, it's the exact same impact, it just over twice the time. <clears throat> so even if, that's kind of a, quite a big problem. So we were like, even though if we make stuff out of organic cotton, renewable energy, um, remanufacture stuff, change the inks, that's not enough. We need to completely redesign the clothing industry which is fine, except we only had a 200 pounds. Uh, so we were, this was a bit of a problem for, <laughs> for a while. Um, and then we're like, it's almost like we need like some sort of magic to make the impossible possible. And modern, that's what tech is, it's magic. So we found tech, this is how we found tech. Um, I'm gonna fast forward now, this is what supply chain looks like. Um, this is a field, an organic cotton field, um, in the north of India where the water comes from rain. Uh, uh, the key ingredient is poo. Um, if you talk long enough, it doesn't matter how advanced the business is, there's poo in it somewhere. And that's, uh, that's what our raw in the material is. Um, good thing about organic cotton as well is because it's high quality and stuff, people get paid more per kilogram they pick. And lots of good things. Lots of insects as well for people who like insects. So a lot of good comes out of there. This is a sense of scale. Um, I probably should say now, now's a good time, to tell everybody that the kind of eco t-shirt brand from the Isle of Wight called Rap Nui is not all that we do. Uh, it's kind of a bit of a joke. Uh, most of our business is in the, now, is in the manufacturing systems and operations of uh, all different types of products in this sector, not just for that brand. So yeah, we, our factory in fresh water, full throttle prints about a t-shirt a second, um, that's the bottleneck. This is the Indian uh, bit where uh, t-shirts are being cut and stuff. Um, we, it, for the macroeconomics people out there, because of all the technology, interestingly, it's actually better overall from an economics point of view to manufacture or do the final print in the UK um, because of all the technology. So it's kind of cool. Um, 
we, the problem we've got is that unfortunately we would rather do more in the Isle of Wight but we run out of space. So that's that. Um, okay, I'm going to try and explain what happens in our factory now. I'm going to get specific without getting, uh, without boring everybody. <coughs> um, uh, What's happening here is that we've developed technology uh, in the freshwater site where we change the way that products are made so that they're only made after they have been ordered. What that means is that uh, computer programs um, um, and uh, manufacturing engineering uh, systems uh, have been developed so that somebody orders something and then in the seconds after that it is manufactured and sent to them. Uh, our customers don't know because it doesn't, they don't experience anything differently. They still order it today and get it tomorrow. It results, though, in large business benefits, including, obviously, zero waste. Um, those kind of algorithms are used to run all different types of thing, things in our business, of which I'll try and give some more specific examples. But uh, to go back to this slide, all of the orders that uh, are placed from this factory uh, for example, there's about 12 ships on the water now between India and here. Um, all of those uh, uh, orders were placed by a machine learning algorithm. Um, that is uh, what is necessary to achieve uh, uh, real-time manufacturing uh, at this scale. Um, so there's Rich, he's a dude, he's from Freshwater. Um, um, and uh, he is uh, walking up to that machine there and the computer is telling him what to do um, and he's doing the skill bits and the computer does all of the boring and repetitive bits. Um, he does not have a degree level uh, education but he is extremely smart and what uh, the technology allows him to do is spend more time adding value and less time doing really miserable stuff that he doesn't want to do. Um, this is a cool picture. This is another part of the factory where uh, one of the printers that prints in bulk volume. So we also manufacture for um, big businesses. Um, I also get them to write them down. People like Red Bull, BBC, um, uh, Body Shop, Lush, Greenpeace, and also the Chuckle Brothers. I'm proud of that one. Um, the, the factory um, algorithms also make decisions about where work is flowed around the factory. So in a traditional manufacturing business, you're always stressing out about like uh, trying to get stuff out the door and um, shifts. Whereas actually in our factory, the computer decides uh, um, stuff like that. That's done with machine-to-machine -machine communications. Um, uh, at which point, uh, we, 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 this is really cool. Uh, the, the, the printer talks to Gareth. Gareth talks to the printer, but the printer also talks to the other machinery. And for example turn stuff on and off depending on how it's going to be used and prepare stuff ready for work so that people don't have to waste time. That's all made possible by um, um, MQTT. Yeah. MQTT Wolfpack. This is an extremely important technology uh, that you should look at. Um, I wanted to say innovation is not just in the UK. Um, this is India. Most fashion businesses uh, try and treat their water and kind of get it acceptable enough to chuck in a river. India's a really cool place that I find really inspiring because actually a lot of people think of it as a poor country, but these young guys here uh, uh, operate uh, this water plant, uh, which we use. Um, this is, by the way, uh, in the middle of nowhere. Um, uh, literally, it's like 150 miles from anywhere. Um, and they, of each one of them, have got chemical engineering degrees, and they kind of um, have this system which completely re... re recirculates and purifies all of the dye water. It's so clean, actually, that uh, not only do they use it again, but you can drink it. Uh, I, I, when I go there, I, just for a laugh, I, I drank it um, to show our customer how clean it was. It's kind of cool. So I just wanted to say that um, you know, all over the world, people are having this conversation. Um, and some, some positive stories, even in rural India, too. OK, so. Uh, uh, the business is successful, it's growing, um, you know, the materials are changed, you get a different outcome. Um, that's it, right? Uh, you just put your feet up. The thing is, if we're really serious as a business about solving the problem, uh, our specific problem with uh, the way that clothes are made, you can't just have one brand. You, you need to fix all brands. And all brands, while well, some of them buy stuff from us, most of them don't. 
because all this stuff like changing the materials and the energy actually costs more money. Um, our economy does not reward this kind of innovation um, on its own. So we need new businesses to um, use uh, to innovate and uh, break up uh, 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 the stuff that is not correct, or to, uh, to provide solutions to businesses like that. Problem is, like ninety percent of fashion starts fail, uh, and I bet a lot of those people got real good ideas, but just don't haven't quite, quite, um, you know. Technically, we sort of failed. We're just too stupid to give up. Um, so uh, we kind of looked at this and we were like, okay, why don't we just take all of the stuff that you need and put it in a package and then just put it on a cloud and like give it away. So what we did is we built this thing called Tmail. Um, and what you can do is as an individual anywhere in the world, um, go online, go to Tmail, build a store, start a brand. It contains, you know, uh, all of the e-commerce stuff you need, the entire supply chain, all of the photography, and um, we have AIs that help you write a spiel if you don't know what to say about your product. Um, they'll do a photo shoot for you. Put your uh, we use uh, computers to put uh, your design on t-shirt. Anyway, it's all free. So the cool thing about it is we we have like a hundred, a couple hundred brands a day, kind of get started on Tmail. I think there's something like 30,000 startups uh, uh, um, and they're all plugged into our factory so when they get an order we it automatically uh, we print it and ship it to the customer in a packaging. Um, I think what was funny is we kind of launched it just to sort of see what would happen uh, and, then, and then mostly it was picked up by charities which is pretty cool because charities are Got a higher bar about the kind of how their stuff is made, but also not very good at business because they're just because they're just charities. So um, the, the the most of the business, I think it's like two million quid so far, has come through the charity fundraising world. Um, there's loads of stuff up on there as well that don't even know that their stuff is made with renewable energy or whatever. They just want to be rad and start a brand. Um, and the cost of each one of hosting each one of those brands is a less than a penny a year to us, um, and that's 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 kind of resulted in a really big increase in the scale of our business. Um, so that worked out pretty good. Um, how long have I got, Tom? Thanks. Um, okay, I'm going to try and talk with specific technologies now. Um, and answer some questions I get asked for time. Will robots steal our jobs? Uh, logistics for 30,000 small businesses is quite hard. Um, even if they are, many of them very small. You can't actually ship all of that stuff without automating large parts of it. So we have got involved in robotics in our factory. Our experience of robotics has been a positive one. I do not think that robotics is by nature positive. I don't think it's by nature negative. It all, intend, it all depends on the intent with which you approach it. So um, what, what we do is um, get our staff involved in the process of uh, automation. This is Adam. He um, used to work on a farm. He learned a bit of printing, and he got kind of frustrated with some of the stuff that he had to do, like walking around, moving around, all that kind of stuff. So uh, his ideas um, uh, we invested in to um, influence the design of our robots. Okay, this is the most important bit, uh, if I can try and get this across. Um, the best thing we did, or in my opinion, is to th not to think about, rather than just say, keep saying tech, 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 tech. Um, try and think instead about how you can make tech, and, and, and try, rather than trying to invest in people who know about tech, try and invest in technologies that actually help people access tech. These are two of my favourites. Um, on the right is, uh, on the left is a box that we made, which contains all of the really clever stuff that powers the robotic side of our factory. Um, it also has some really easy bits where you just poke a wire in. So if you don't know how the brain works, you can at least kind of get involved with it. So the, the, um, 
this makes it really easy for people just to build robots. It's kind of like a Lego kit for robots, that's a better way of saying it. And on the right is a product uh, that was made, is it an IBM product? I don't know. I have no red. Right, IBM is wicked, check it out. Uh, it means that you can write code even if you can't write, write code. Think about that for a second. Everyone's a coder. So when people ask us stuff like, come to a factory and see all these machines move around, like, who wrote all this code? Everybody did. Um, there's about 50 people in our factory in Freshwater and pretty much everybody gets algorithm training um, and can influence the way the code uh, works. It's how we get such a faster growth. Uh, you know, I think uh, this is really cool because one of the things that I feel quite passionate about is the more we talk about technology, the more we talk about code, the more actually it seems like this is some sort of matrix like Everest that only the brainiest can get over. This is not true. Somebody who knows how to print, knows the rules about how to print, they can encode it. We, we need, as tech leaders, to make it easier for people to do this stuff and access this technology. That's why I love uh, Node Red. Um, it's so rad seeing the look on people's faces when they write some code and then the robots move around. Uh, also, rather than say, uh, where are the people in this photo, think instead about what the person who made this uh, had, had, you know, what, what, would you, what would you think of the value of that person? Uh, Adam's uh, introduction was scraping ink off screens in overalls uh, four years ago. He built this. His career has, is extremely steep. Um, these enabling technologies have taken a farmhand, and I asked him permission to say this, he, 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 with the minimum of qualifications that are required to exit school, just about, and is now a robotics engineer. This is, this is why enabling technologies uh, matter more than uh, celebrating how extremely clever they are. We should try and make them more approachable and easy. Okay, there you go, that's my rant. Uh, some, some specifics or uh, specific examples. Um, uh, what do people do each day? This is how a t shirt comes out. Someone walks up to this machine on the left here, it's one part of the factory. Uh, it knows who they are. Um, this is hello. Um, it it uh, makes decisions about what they are going to do. For example, it thinks it, this is, what's actually happening is they go get a t shirt ready to be printed in this real time part of the factory. It, it thinks about where is the easiest place to get that product from and directs in there so they don't have to walk too far. It reorganizes work depending on its priority. Um, and it also thinks about the abilities or qualifications of the person. For example, if they haven't had ladder training, it won't send them up somewhere high. Or if they're in a wheelchair or something like that, uh, uh, it will send them to somewhere that they can access. Um, another cool thing is that it talks to all of the other machines and printers downstream and upstream and stuff and says, yeah, get ready, there's an order coming. And it turns all the heaters on and off and whatnot. And then this blue light here is really cool because it just um, it, it indicates the speed uh, of the worker. And I just want to be clear, that those, those, those work rates are set by the staff, not, not me. Um, so because I distracted them all and said, I need to take a photo, it's gone blue, uh, which means uh, it's a bit slow. That's my bad. OK, that's what's happening there. And you can see that. Um, it's just about making their lives easier. All right, uh, I was going to try really hard to explain how an AI works. Nope, I don't have time for that. That's a shame. No, I'm stuff it, I'm going to do it, because otherwise we don't know what we're talking about. AIs can be really easy. I'll give you two examples. There's loads of different ways to approach AI, loads of different ways to build an AI. The simplest possible way to build an AI is something that we'll all find natural. And even the more advanced forms of AI even feel even more natural. That's why they seem clever, because they're human-like. But I just want to say that everybody is a native AI developer. They just maybe don't realize it yet. Really simply, imagine you uh, had a caterpillar. Uh, you wanted to have a business where you're going to sell caterpillars or something. And you were trying to work out, like, what's the best color? So you'd be like, why don't we just try different, two different colors, like green and blue, and then we like see what people think. Everyone would logically do that, right? AI basically is a simple form of AI would be to take the same thing and then let the computer have its own responsibility for deciding the winner after a certain amount of time has passed. Because there's always that crazy person that picks the wrong color, but let's get like 200 people, right? 
And then you just give it the ability to spawn a new colour once it says, all right, blue's out, what, well, let's try, I don't know, red. And that actually works pretty good, really, really good. It's like a Darwinian winner stays on algorithm for really simple problems. That's all there is to it. Everybody can understand that, I'm sure. Um, we use those kind of AIs all the time. Um, the problem is when you get to like really complex stuff like, okay, blue, red, but how about the number of legs, eyes and feet, and how about size? You sort of have multiple variables and it's like, instead of A, B, you could be like A, B, C, D, E, or like, and also another variable like one, two, three, four, five. So it's like A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, B1, B2. So everybody's getting confused now and going, where's this going? That's the point. You kind of get to a bit of a problem with this kind of algorithm where there's limits to how much it can handle complex problems. Here's another type of AI. I think uh, I would be right in saying that the last one was basically where we got to with the chess playing stuff, uh, and this was a kind of a, is a bit of a breakthrough. You sort of go, well, why don't we just copy what nature does? And I'm going to neural network deep learning people will cover your ears. I'm going to butcher your craft. Um, imagine like a child, it's just born with all this stuff, and then it just tries something random. As long as you give it like a yay, well done, when it does something right, it just kind of goes okay. Um, that's kind of. <laughs> Kind of how neural network works. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so what we what we what you can do is you can give it extremely complex problems that have multiple variables, things like art, and uh, as long as you give it a success condition, it will sort of figure it out. Now this is different because one of, if you're in business and you're like, I'm going to try to rub some of this AI stuff on my business. This is going to work really great. Just be careful because you need to accept that if you're going to do that, it learns like a child. There is a risk that it will hurt itself and make a mistake. So the, the good thing, unlike a child, they have an immensely good memory. Um, um, and you can copy and paste them. Uh, however, um, you do have to understand that it will cock stuff up. So before you plug it in, you have to think extremely carefully about what the consequences of that might be. All right, I'll give you some a quick examples as quickly as I can. Um, this is an example. Um, we always used to write handwritten notes on Rapa Nui stuff and still do. When we got all of these other businesses, they wanted a handwritten note too. All of their handwritten notes are extremely long and complex. Um, writing a handwritten note gives the customer an extremely warm feeling. Um, unfortunately, it kind of gives our staff repetitive strain injury. Uh, could we write an AI that could write? So what we did was we were like, well, maybe we could read. And that was kind of easy. We just got the code off the internet. And then we fed it like 500,000 people's handwriting samples that University of Toronto published, um, which was handy. And then it learned to write. Um, and then this is a, a, a thank you note. I, I brought something, actually. For those that don't know about this, the entire code was written and run on this Rajakai which I got free of magazine. This is a crazy town. Um, obviously it's in the cloud now, but I just thought it was fun. Um, you can do more advanced stuff. This is uh, not my work, this is just an example where uh, someone wrote AI and taught it to paint in the style of Van Gogh. Um, you have to understand that with a neural network, those neurons are essentially kind of like taking a scrape of someone's brain. It obviously doesn't have like social functions, but it is literally a replica of the way that someone thinks like that. And then here's it painting that dog in the style of a Van Gogh. And then we can use Timo to put it on a t-shirt, do a photo shoot. It wrote a, a paragraph about the deep blue bark t-shirt. It could learn uh, based on the responses of uh, how people use the website, whether or not they liked it. And you could make dog lovers extremely happy uh, faster if you wanted to. Just an, an example of where you could go. There are other ways to do it as well. This is a clever guy called Wolfram, and he, he kind of figured out that if you put numbers next to each other and set rules about what they do depending on their neighbours, you get these really weird organic patterns in stuff, and that turns out that actually that's how nature figures out a lot of stuff. We use this for um, uh, human-like behaviour. So here's an example of a CRM. It's a person who was having a conversation with one of our AIs. Uh, the AI kind of went, oh, hey, uh, Mary. Um, Noticed you having problems with your store. Is everything cool? And she was like, uh, "Yeah, this is this is this is the problem that I had." So you can give people really great lifelike support, and we always have a person on the loop um, for these things. But it just uh, assists our staff in being more productive, which um, is good. 
Also, this is a really vanilla one. This is an AI that's working right now. I screen grabbed this yesterday, and it has a. It's allowed to play around with the prices in the cart, and uh, it's figuring out um, um, stuff. It, what's, what's interesting about this one is that one of the benefits of AI is it sometimes comes up with ideas that you can you have not thought of. Who would have thought that putting the postage price of shipping up results in an increase in sales? That does not sound right. Um, however, uh, it is. I guess people just think, wow, it's really going to come fast then. Um, this is a real big benefit of AI. There's a big drawback equally, of which is the same problem. I'd like to ask everybody to imagine a river. Um, obviously, we can all imagine water flowing in a valley. What we don't imagine is more interesting. The meandering, the estuary, the different changing of the seasons, the rocks, the newts, the shopping trolleys, the kids fishing. <clears throat> the problem is with people is that when we think about stuff, we only think, we only realize a part of what we think. And then when we say it, we really struggle to express entirely what we mean. The problem with AIs is they do exactly what you told them to. Anyone who's written code knows what I'm talking about. So when we set up AIs, even if we have the best intentions, sometimes we can get results that we didn't think of, which can be good, but also that can be bad. And because we can't really visualize them very well, like show me the AI, um, this can cause problems. Like for example, when we drew the 2D uh, neural network, one of the things I find interesting about neural nets is they're always, always drawn in 2D, whereas actually the brain's neural networks are 3D. This is why a child learns to kick a ball and can kick a watermelon because it associates the shape of a watermelon with a ball. Whereas maybe, I don't know, but if you wrote a robot that was going to kick a ball, if you presented it like a watermelon, it might struggle. So here's an example. Uh-oh. This was the handwritten note. We tested it to the death. Like 100,000 orders. Didn't want to go any near until it was perfect. And then one day someone came in and goes, I think you got a problem here. I mean, we tested it in French, in Spanish, and that is what happens when someone puts an asterisk in the note. The thing is, we all know that what an asterisk is. We can r draw an asterisk. However, the neural network did not, it, it, it did literally what we told it to, learned handwriting. And an asterisk is not handwriting, so <clears throat> And I had similar experiences, for example, um, uh, with robotics. If you make a mistake, you start fires. Uh, um, the way that I, I want to make a point on this, just uh, will AI do muscle, it's, it's just a tool like a chainsaw. The lumberjack that wanted a chainsaw probably thought, ah, oh, this is great, I'm only going to have to work on Mondays. Um, but we have invented ways to harm ourselves with chainsaws. Um, AI is an even more powerful chainsaw, but it's quite hard to visualize. So it's kind of like an invisible chainsaw. Like, I, I would approach that with extreme caution. So, um, it's not to say it's not a good thing, but we should be uh, humble with uh, the power that it brings. Last two slides, promise. What, is, what do people do at Rap New Year Day? Uh, this is a visualization of an AI's behavior. This is a mean, median mode of the average customer that experienced this particular behavioral content that AI has generated. Uh, we're trying to visualize it, work out whether or not it's like really annoying or whatever. In the bottom right, uh, Natalie, she's a graduate, uh, marketing graduate. Um, um, she's been coached by uh, one of a team who was a uh, apprentice, and this kind of style of work is all he's ever known, which is cool. Um, the guys are not working super hard on actually executing it, they're thinking about, they're thinking more. And in the top right, that's Pam, she's 65 and she works in, she's working with a robot, how cool is that? Um, and there's Enya um, working on a pack station, it's just a demonstration um, of, of how changing the user interfaces and using this kind of technology makes it really easy to do, do your job. Okay, uh, I have one more point to make uh, because I was asked to, sorry for overrunning. Um, uh, which was, what do I think about doing this kind of thing on the Isle of Wight as a place to do businesses? Um, as, when, we, when we started, um, I think uh, County Press uh, wrote an article that said um, 
two young businessmen starting this brilliant business. Um, and I think on event bloggers on the white then also did like a 25 minute interview talking about our business. We must have been talking absolute rubbish. Uh, we knew nothing at that point. Um, you know, we had a CTO of IBM come around our factory and uh, teach us stuff like schoolboy level, immensely patient. Um, I was saying to Matt and Kat, we had, a, we had a calf and they came round and gave us a positive review even though it was rubbish. Um, it's a great place, it's a great society and a, a place to do, a great community to, to build a business. And the last thing I want to say is, uh, you know, in terms of the economy, yeah, there are some issues with our economy, uh, in the traditional economy. And uh, I don't want to um, comment too much on like uh, on that. But uh, some, I find it an interesting point about the link, making a, like the idea of having links to mainland and fixed link stuff. The, the future economy, transactions happen through fiber optic cables. Um, but you imagine a fixed link that was infinite light speed you could reach or access anyone anywhere in the world. It costs you nothing. You could have it in your hand right now. Would you take it? We've got a digital fixed link. It's called the internet. And what we would like to see uh, is more companies on the Isle of Wight be encouraged to get involved with the internet because um, it's a really great place to do business. You do not need to be somewhere else. Um, you don't need to be anywhere to do that kind of business. Um, instead, you can choose where you want to be. And I think um, uh, that's a picture of our lunch break. I think it's choice between that or the tube. It's a no-brainer. Thanks very much.